Explanation of the Content Further explanation is divided into four parts, that is, the four teachings. 1. The Tripitaka Teaching First, the clarification of the Tripitaka Teaching. What is the content of that called the Tripitaka Teaching? This refers to the three stores of the Buddha's teaching. First, the collection of the sutras. Second, the collection of the Vinaya. And third, the collection of the Abhidharma. Are these terms, sutra and so forth, Sanskrit, or are they Chinese? They are Sanskrit. What are they in Chinese? Sutra is sometimes translated and sometimes not. When it is translated, various people translate it in different ways. However, many use the translation Dharma source. Vinaya is translated as extinction. Abhidharma is translated as incomparable Dharma. For what reason are the translations Dharma source and so forth used? A sutra is called a dharma source because it is a source of verbal teachings concerning the world-transcending good dharma. In the Vinaya, the Buddha expounds on the intentional and spontaneous precepts and how to extinguish evil physical and verbal activity. Therefore, it is translated as extinction. In Abhidharma, the meaning of the dharma is analyzed by the noble one's wisdom, which is incomparable in this world. Therefore, it is translated as incomparable dharma. Which sutras and treatises are the dharma source in the Tripitaka teaching? Here, the fourfold agama is the dharma source. The Vinaya of 80 recitations is the text for extinction of passionate attachments. And the Abhidharma treatises are the incomparable dharma. Are these Abhidharma treatises taught directly by the Buddha, or are they explanations by his disciples? Whether they are analyses of the meaning of the Dharma by the Buddha himself, or by the Buddha's disciples, they are all called Abhidharma. Of these two, whose explanation is indicated? Indeed, it indicates the Buddha's explanation. An exposition by the Buddha is called a sutra, and an exposition by a bodhisattva is called a treatise. There are no treatises attributed to the Buddha during his life. How can there be an Abhidharma attributed to the Buddha? From the standpoint of the Mahayana, there are no collections of treatises attributed to the Buddha during his life. But from the standpoint of the Hinayana, there are Abhidharma treatises attributed to the Buddha. Supposing that there are Hinayana Abhidharmas attributed to the Buddha, these are expositions by Sariputra and not by the Buddha. These are expositions by Sariputra that follow and repeat those of the Buddha. How can we know that the Buddha himself preached an Abhidharma treatise? Because the Xiang Su Chi To Ching is also called an Abhidharma treatise. Why are these three Dharma collections all called stores? They get this meaning by containing. What Dharmas do they contain? Some say that the text contains the truth concerning reality. Others say that reality contains the text. Therefore, they are called stores. Now, I say that of these three Dharma collections, each contains all verbal truth concerning reality. Therefore, they are called stores. Do these three stores correspond to precepts, concentration, and wisdom? They do correspond. How do they correspond? The sutras correspond to the concentration store. The Vinaya correspond to the precepts store and the Abhidharma corresponds to the wisdom store. What is the basis of this correspondence? The fourfold Agama often clarify methods of cultivating the Dharma. The Vinaya correctly identifies how to keep the precepts according to the situation and the way to resist evil mental, physical, and verbal intentions. The Abhidharma is the analysis of the Dharma of undefiled wisdom. 
We agree that this correspondence is true. Why is their order different? When one cultivates the Dharma, the collection of precepts has priority. When the teachings are preached, the collection of sutras comes first. Now we are referring to the teachings, so the order is not the same. What reality does this Tripitaka teaching clarify? It clarifies the reality of the Four Noble Truths as the actual arising and perishing of conditioned co-arising. For whose sake is this taught? It is taught as correct for those of the Hinayana and as marginal for instructing bodhisattvas. The Buddha first exposed the doctrine of the three vehicles within the Tripitaka teaching. The Mahayana is the supreme teaching. Why is not the Mahayana presented as correct and the Hinayana as marginal? At the Deer Park, the Buddha first preached the Sermon on the Four Noble Truths. Five men, Ajnata, Kaundinya, and so forth, perceived the truth and realized the path, and eighty thousand divine beings attained pure insight into the truth. However, since this was the attainment of the Hinayana path, there was not yet any attainment of the Mahayana. So the Hinayana was taught as correct, and the Mahayana as marginal. Who are the Hinayanists? And who are the Mahayanists? The Shravakas and Pratyeka Buddhas are the Hinayanists. The Bodhisattvas are the Mahayanists. Why are they called Shravakas or voice hearers? They hear the Buddha's voice as he teaches. Therefore, they are called voice hearers. There are many types of teaching taught by the Buddha's voice. Which verbal teaching do they hear? They hear the exposition of the teaching of the principle of the Four Noble Truths as arising and perishing. Which delusions are severed by hearing this verbal teaching? The delusions of false views and attitudes are severed. What is the meaning of the delusions of false views and attitudes? This will be explained in detail in the section on severing delusions. How many stages does one pass through to attain the fruit of enlightenment by severing delusions? One passes successively through four stages. One, the lower level of ordinary people. Two, the higher level of ordinary people. Three, the partial attainment of sagacity. And four, the ultimate stage of the sage. How many stages are there in the first? the lower level of ordinary people. Altogether, there are three stages. The five meditations, mindfulness concerning objects individually, and mindfulness concerning objects in general. What are the five meditations? They are, one, to put the mind at rest by means of compassion. Two, to put the mind at rest by counting one's breaths. Three, to put the mind at rest by meditating on conditioned co-arising. Four, to put the mind at rest by meditating on impurities. And five, to put the mind at rest by being mindful of the Buddha. How many obstacles are overcome by these five meditations? Five obstacles are overcome. The meditation on compassion overcomes anger. The meditation of counting one's breath overcomes distraction. The meditation on conditioned co-arising overcomes ignorance. The meditation on impurities overcomes covetousness. Being mindful of the Buddha overcomes obstacles to the path. What are the characteristics and practices of mindfulness concerning objects individually? Five obstacles have already been removed, and the wisdom of contemplation has been clarified considerably. Next, one should perform the contemplation that involves mindfulness concerning four objects in order to destroy the four warped views. What is mindfulness concerning four objects and four warped views? Mindfulness concerning four objects refers to that concerning the body, sensation, mind, and dharmas. The four warped views are those of permanence, pleasure, selfhood, and purity. 
what is the purpose of contemplation that involves mindfulness of these four objects? To contemplate the impurity of the body, the lack of pleasure in sensations, the transiency of the mind, and the non-substantiality of dharmas. Why are the warped views identified as those of permanence, pleasure, selfhood, and purity? It is because ordinary people cling to permanence, pleasure, selfhood, and purity with regard to the impure, and so forth. Are the four objects of which one is mindful and the five aggregates the same or different? The terms are different, but the meaning is the same. What do you mean when you say that their meaning is the same? The body corresponds to the aggregate of form. Sensations correspond to the aggregate of sensation. The mind corresponds to the aggregate of consciousness. Dharmas correspond to the two aggregates of conceptions and volitional activities. Are there different capabilities for cultivating mindfulness of these four objects? Those who have the capability for seeking liberation through wisdom cultivate only insight into the specific nature of each of the four objects of which one is mindful, and thus destroy attachment to the four individual warped views of permanence, pleasure, selfhood, and purity. Those who have the capability for seeking liberation through both wisdom and contemplation cultivate insight into the common characteristics of the four aspects of which one is mindful, and thus destroy the warped views concerning phenomena and reality. Those who have the capability for seeking liberation cultivate all three kinds of mindfulness concerning the four objects, that is, one, to be mindful of each individually, two, to be mindful of their common characteristics, and three, to be mindful of all their characteristics simultaneously. And thus they destroy the four warped views concerning all phenomena, reality, words, and so forth. What are the practices of mindfulness concerning the common features of the four objects? One has already destroyed the four warped views through the wisdom gained from mindfulness concerning the objects of body, sensation, mind, and dharmas individually. Now one destroys four warped views generally through a profound and fine contemplative wisdom. How many kinds of mindfulness concerning the common features are there? There are three distinct kinds. One, general contemplation of the objects in general. Two, general contemplation of the objects individually. And three, individual contemplation of the objects in general. It is as you say, with regard to the lower level of ordinary people. How about the higher level of ordinary people? There are four sub-levels of the higher level of ordinary people. One, warming up. 2. The summit of concentration, 3. Patience, and 4. Dharma supreme in the world. What is the meaning of the levels of warming up and so forth? 1. The level of warming up refers to arousing approximate understanding through mindfulness of the four objects individually and in general and thus attaining insight into the sixteen truths, the four aspects of the four noble truths, and the aura of the Buddha Dharma. It is like kindling a fire and arousing smoke. Two, the level of the summit of concentration refers to approximate understanding that is further increased to the attainment of the four supranormal concentrative states and a further clarification of the sixteen truths that is superior to the level of warming up, it is like climbing to the mountain summit and observing all directions with complete clarity. 3. The level of patience refers to the desire for patience through contemplation of the four truths. And 4. The level of Dharma supreme in the world refers to the highest level of ordinary people attained in an instant from the highest level of patience. The higher levels of ordinary people are as explained. How many levels are included in the stage of partial sagehood? There are four causal stages and three resultant stages. What are they each called? 
One, the causal stage of the Shrodhapana. Two, the resultant stage of the Shrodhapana. Three, the causal stage of Sakradagaman. Four, the resultant stage of the Sakradagaman. Five, the causal stage of the Anagaman. Six, the resultant stage of the Anagaman. And seven, the causal state of the Arhat. Are the terms Shrodhapana and so forth Sanskrit or Chinese? They are Sanskrit terms. What are their Chinese equivalents? Shrodhapana is translated as entering the stream. It is also translated as stream winner. Entering has the same meaning as winning. It refers to one who has just entered the noble stream of the Buddhist path. Sakradagaman means once returner. It refers to one who, after finishing the present life, is reborn in heaven, from which he is once more reborn as a human being who will attain the stage of the Anagaman. Anagaman means the non-returner. It refers to one who will never again return to this world of desires. The stages of partial sagehood are such. What is the stage of ultimate sagehood? The stage of ultimate sagehood is the resultant stage of the arhat. Is there a translation for the term arhat? There is no translation for this term, but it contains three meanings. What are these three meanings? One who has killed the traitor of passions, one who has no more rebirths, and one who is worthy of homage. Of these four levels, how many are labeled the wise, and how many the sagacious? The two levels of ordinary people are labeled the wise, and the two levels of partial and ultimate sagehood are labeled the sagacious. What do you mean by labeling these the wise and the sagacious? The wise is close to the sagacious, therefore it is called wise. One is able to conquer the delusions of wrong views and concepts by means of approximate understanding. One arouses true understanding by means of this approximate understanding, and therefore it is called close to sagacity. Sagacity means correct. One is called a sage because he or she correctly contemplates suffering, and thus severs the delusions of mistaken views, thus arousing true understanding and severing the delusions of false attitudes, leaving behind the stage of the ordinary person to enter that of the sage, and perceiving reality with true wisdom. Next, is the term Pradyeka Buddha Sanskrit or Chinese? It is Sanskrit. What is it in Chinese? This is translated into Chinese as one who is awakened concerning conditions. This refers to one who lives during the time of a Buddha and, by hearing an exposition on twelvefold condition co arising, immediately awakens to Pradyeka Buddhahood. How many varieties of Pradyeka Buddhas are there? There are two kinds. Those who appear during the time of the Buddha have already been mentioned. If they are to appear during a time when there is no Buddha in the world, they have an immediate spontaneous awakening to Pradyeka Buddhahood while contemplating the scattering of flowers or the falling of leaves. What is their status with regard to the stages of ordinary people and sages? The distinct stages of the ordinary person and the sage, and the meaning of the resultant enlightenment upon severing delusions, are all the same as the Shravaka. There are no differences, except that they overcome the habitual propensities of passions. Next, is the term Bodhisattva Sanskrit or Chinese? It is Sanskrit. In Chinese, the longer transliteration is Putisata but here we use the abbreviated Pusa. What is the meaning in Chinese? Bodhi means enlightenment, or the mind that aspires for the Buddha's path, and Sattva means a sentient being. What vows are made by a Bodhisattva? 
he or she makes four great vows at the time of his first aspiration for enlightenment. What are these four great vows? One, to save all who are not yet saved by the vow. Though there are unlimited sentient beings, I vow to save them. Two, to awaken those who do not yet understand by the vow. Though there are unlimited passions, I vow to sever them. Three, to soothe those who are not yet settled by the vow. Though there are inexhaustible doctrines, I vow to know them. And four, to lead to nirvana those who have not yet attained nirvana by the vow. Though the Buddhist path is supreme, I vow to fulfill it. Concerning these four great vows, what conditions allow one to arouse the aspiration for enlightenment? One arouses the aspiration for enlightenment and vows to save all who have yet to be saved by contemplating the truth of suffering. One arouses the aspiration for enlightenment and vows to lead to understanding those who do not yet understand by contemplating the truth concerning the causes of suffering. One arouses the aspiration for enlightenment and vows to soothe those who are not yet settled by contemplating the truth of the Buddhist path. One arouses the aspiration for enlightenment and vows to lead to nirvana those who have not yet attained nirvana by contemplating the truth concerning the extinction of suffering. What practices should be cultivated after arousing the aspiration for enlightenment? One should cultivate the practice of the six perfections. What are the six perfections? They are 1. Dana Paramita, 2. Sila Paramita, 3. Ksanti Paramita, 4. Virya Paramita, 5. Dhyana Paramita, and 6. Prajna Paramita. Are Dana Paramita and so forth Sanskrit or Chinese? They are Sanskrit terms. What are the Chinese equivalents? Dana means charity. Paramita means to reach the other shore, to leave behind this shore of the cyclic world of birth and death and arrive at the other shore of nirvana. The term sila refers to the precepts. Kshante means patience. Virya means diligence. Dhyana means putting an end to evil delusions through meditation. And prajna means wisdom. What obstacles are overcome through the perfections of charity and so forth? Covetousness is overcome through the perfection of charity. The breaking of precepts is overcome through the keeping of precepts. Anger is overcome through patience. Slothfulness is overcome through diligence. Distraction and confusion are overcome through meditation. And ignorance is overcome through wisdom. How long must one cultivate these six perfections? One must pass through three incalculable eons. What is the first incalculable eon and so forth? The first incalculable eon is from the time the Bodhisattva Sakya first met the ancient Buddha Sakyamuni until the time of the Buddha Kanusikin. The second incalculable eon is from the time of the Buddha Sikhin to the time of the Buddha Daipamkara. The third incalculable eon is from the time of the Buddha Daipamkara to the time of the Buddha Vipassian. How many Buddhas did this Bodhisattva pay homage to during these three incalculable eons? In the Abhidharma Kosabhasya, it says, during each of the incalculable eons, he paid homage to 70,000 Buddhas, and in addition, he paid homage to five, six, and 7,000 Buddhas. What is the meaning of this treatise passage? The treatise gives the following interpretation. During the first eon, he paid homage to 75,000 Buddhas. During the second eon, he paid homage to 76,000 Buddhas. During the third eon, he paid homage to 77,000 Buddhas. Do the periods of meeting the ancient Sakyamuni to that of the Buddha Vipassian 
belong to the beginning or completion of an eon. The verses of the Kosa say, At the completion of the three incalculable eons, he respectively met, in reverse order, the Buddhas, Vipassian, Daipamkara, and Ratnasikin, and then he first became Sakyamuni. What is the meaning of these verses? The treatise explains them as follows. At the beginning of the first incalculable eon, he met the ancient Sakyamuni. At the completion of the first incalculable eon, he met the Buddha Ratnasikin. At the completion of the second incalculable eon, he met the Buddha Daipamkara. At the completion of the third eon, he met Vipassian. At what time did this Bodhisattva acquire the thirty-two major marks of a Buddha? After one hundred eons at the latest, and after ninety-one eons at the earliest. How do we know that it was acquired after the earliest possible span of ninety-one eons? The Buddha Pusya saw Sakyamuni and perceived that he had matured his potential as a disciple and that it would be easy for him to advance to the other shore of enlightenment. Therefore, he cast a ray of light from within his cave that illuminated a great distance. The Bodhisattva saw this light and sought its source. He arrived at the place where the Buddha Pusha was and, for seven days and nights, single-mindedly contemplated the Buddha without blinking his eyes. His ascetic practices were more praiseworthy than those of Maitreya, so he attained Buddhahood nine eons earlier. What is required to fulfill the causes of the thirty-two major marks of a Buddha? A hundred good qualities are needed to fulfill each and every cause. What is one good quality? There are many interpretations of good quality, so it is difficult to determine its exact meaning. Some say that the mastery that the world ruler has over all the lands under heaven is one good quality. Some say that the mastery of Indra in the thirty-three heavens is one good quality. Some say that to heal the blindness of people in this universe is one good quality. Some say that the ability to preach the Dharma in a way that leads all people who break the precepts to forsake their immoral ways is a good quality. Some say that it is beyond analogizing and that only the Buddha can know it. In which continent? In what body, at what time, and under what conditions were the causes of these marks planted? The causes for these marks were planted in the southern continent, in a male body, at the time of the appearance of a Buddha in this world, under the conditions of a Buddha body. In cultivating the six perfections, is there a specific time when this practice is perfected? There is a time of perfection when one has no obstacles in giving alms. For example, charity was perfected when King Sivi gave his body to be eaten by a hawk on behalf of a dove. The keeping of the precepts was perfected when King Sudasoma, losing his throne, still wrote a verse praising the moral life and did not indulge in slander. Patience was perfected when the hermit Xante bore no resentment as his limbs were severed by King Kali and his body was restored. Diligence was perfected when Prince Mahachya Gavat entered the sea to search for a wish-fulfilling jewel for the sake of all the people. He finally obtained the jewel from the hair of the dragon king to help the poor. However, the sea god hid the treasure while he was sleeping. When the prince awoke, he vowed to scoop out the entire ocean with his own body. Indra was moved by this sight, and all the heavenly deities helped him until it was half done. Also, for seven days, Sakyamuni stood on one foot and praised the Buddha Pusya. Concentration was perfected when a bird built a nest in the hair of the hermit Sankacharya while he was in a concentrative state. He did not emerge from this concentrative state until the chicks could fly away. Wisdom was perfected when the Prime Minister Govinda divided the land of Jambudvipa into seven parts, which put an end to the bitter fighting between the seven countries. During which incalculable eon 
did this bodhisattva come to know that he would attain Buddhahood? During the second incalculable eon, he came to know that he would attain Buddhahood, but he did not verbally say so. During the third incalculable eon, he both knew and said so. If so, at what stage did he fulfill Buddhahood? He passed through the lower, middle, and higher stages of patience, and that of the Dharma Supreme in the world, and in the last moment he attained Buddhahood. What time is referred to by the terms lower stage of patience to the last moment? The last one hundred eons within the third incalculable eon to the fulfillment of the six perfections are the lower stage of patience. Next, one enters the highest stage of the Bodhisattva just prior to attaining Buddhahood, is born in the Tushita heaven, enters his mother's womb, leaves home, and conquers Mara. After scattering the forces of evil, he sits peacefully and cultivates concentration. This is the middle stage of patience. In the next moment, he enters the higher stage of patience. In the next moment, he enters the stage of the Dharma Supreme in the world. In the next moment, he attains the fulfillment of Buddhahood. What were his practices at the time of the fulfillment of Buddhahood? He aroused true non-defilement, attained the thirty-four enlightened mental states by severing the bonds of craving, and fulfilled the Hinayana Buddhahood. The saint of the Himalayas offered some soft grass, and the Tathagata accepted it, sat on it, and fulfilled supreme enlightenment. This fulfillment of the path on a grass seat under a tree is that of the inferior body of transformation. Do you have evidence for the type of bodhisattva that you discuss? The Tachi Tu Lun clarifies that Katyayani Putra established the classification of bodhisattvas of the six perfections of the Tripitaka teachings. This is the evidence. Why do those of the two vehicles sever their bonds in this life and quickly attain the fruit of the path? But bodhisattvas do not yet sever their bonds while traversing from their first aspiration to the stage of conquering evil and do not attain the fruit of the path quickly. Those of the two vehicles contemplate the Four Noble Truths and twelvefold conditioned co-arising, and thus grow weary of the cycle of birth and death, seek nirvana on their own, and prepare themselves for their own salvation. Therefore they sever their bonds first, and attain the fruit of the path in this life. The Bodhisattva has compassion, and thus puts the benefit of others first, and himself last. For three incalculable eons he cultivates the six perfections. Therefore he or she does not attain the fruit quickly. The object of contemplation is not the same for those of the Hinayana and the Mahayana. Is there a difference also in the wisdom that does the contemplating? There are distinctions with regard to the time necessary for cultivating the causes of enlightenment. The Shravaka takes three lifetimes during sixty eons. The Pratyeka Buddha takes four lifetimes during one hundred eons. And the Bodhisattva takes three incalculable eons. Nevertheless, they all utilize the wisdom of inferior salvation through the understanding of emptiness by analysis, analyzing all things into the five substantial aggregates from which they are composed. Thus they all conclude with the same one-sided truth. This is explained in detail in the commentary The Su Chao Yi by Qi Yi.